Good afternoon, everyone. Um, again, so wonderful to, to follow such a beautiful uh, performance before, uh, before this topic, which sounds a little bit of a, a scary subject, but um, I will try to bring some uh, optimism for, for a positive idea of, uh, of human, humankind, um, hopefully, by the end of this. Um, and a thank you to, to Kirsten, too, for giving me this opportunity to speak to you all today. So the subject that I will be presenting is why H.G. Wells's world brain and Yuval Harari's hackable human will not succeed, a study on the abolition of man. In 2018, Yuval Harari delivered a presentation to the World Economic Forum titled Will the future be human? In his presentation, Harari seemed to be confirming our very worst fears of a dystopic future right out of a sci-fi movie, that we risked annihilating ourselves if we continued down the path we were already on as we progressed into an age of advanced technology. These stark predictions by Harari were received almost as if he were a prophet. His visions of the future he was certain would come about but he was unclear as to any detail concerning how such a future would come about, how, and most importantly, um, how we would best avoid such a fate. When Harari was questioned after his presentation and in another Q&A session at the same World Economic Forum meeting, all Harari could repeat what is, was his own algorithm for a very general doomsday prophecy to all other questions that pertained to specifics or mechanics of how such a dystopic future would play out, he would answer that he did not know. This should strike any thinker as problematic. That is, are we supposed to listen to Harari as if he were a scholar or a prophet? If we are to take Harari as a scholar that has developed insight into the subjects he discusses from, his, uh, from the studies he has made, then it is a problem that he cannot discuss such specifics, but rather entirely avoids them. In fact, as we break down Harari's own algorithms that he uses to form his vision for such a dystopic future, we see them riddled with personal assumptions, judgments, and conclusions masked as objective algorithms. For those who may not be aware, an algorithm is a process or set of rules to be followed in calculations or other problem-solving operations, especially by a computer. Before we look at some of these biological algorithms of Harari, which have purported his theory that humans are hackable, we should quickly review how such a mathematical and evolutionary viewpoint came to be accepted in academia in defining human nature and the universe we live in. Harari has clearly drawn from the works of Darwin, Bertrand Russell, H.G. Wells in his work, and thus it is useful for us to review how their works influenced our understanding of human nature and the universe. That is, how a modern science was created to in turn create a modern religion, which in turn would promise us a modern utopia. If this sounds outlandish to you, may I remind you that H.G. Wells as well as Bertrand Russell, Aldous Huxley, and Harari himself have written and discussed about the need to bring such a thing about. In Harari's presentation to the World Economic Forum in 2020, the moderator brought up the parallels of George Orwell's 1984 and Aldous Huxley's Brave New World in relation to Harari's predictions for, of the future. This is most certainly relevant, but not in the way you may be thinking. This excerpt from Huxley's Brave New World gets at the very core justification for why a scientific dictatorship is needed and how it is perpetuated, namely by denying purpose, by denying intention. This does not just pertain to us discussing evolution and human nature, but even to how the universe itself functions. Huxley wrote, a new theory of biology was the title of the paper which Mustafa Mohn had just finished reading. He sat for some time meditatively frowning, then picked up his pen and wrote across the title page, the author's mathematical treatment of the conception of purpose is novel and highly ingenious, but heretical, and so far as the present social order is concerned, dangerous and potentially subversive, not to be published. 
A pity, he thought, as he signed his name. It was a masterly piece of work. But once you began admitting explanations in terms of purpose, well, you didn't know what the result might be. It was the sort of idea that might easily decondition the more unsettled minds among the higher castes, make them lose their faith in happiness as the sovereign good, and take to believing instead that the goal was somewhere beyond, somewhere outside the present human sphere, that the purpose of life was not the maintenance of well-being as the lower forms of happiness and comfort, but some intensification and refining of consciousness, some enlargement of knowledge, which was, the controller reflected, quite possibly true, but not in the present circumstance admissible. In fact, Aldous is the continuation of that legacy to deny purpose in the sciences. It was his grandfather, T.H. Huxley, who self-professed himself as Darwin's bulldog, who propelled Darwin's theory of evolution to such heights that the entire field of the sciences were never to be the same again. They were to become the modern sciences. What this meant was that centuries upon centuries of scientists, uh, excuse me, centuries upon centuries of scientists from all around the world, from diverse cultures who had largely viewed the universe as having intention and purpose with a creator, were now to be relegated to the dustbins of irrelevance. Darwin had apparently proved that the universe was without purpose and that there was no creator with an intelligent design. However, this is not true. Darwin never proved such a thing. Darwin's theory of evolution came about after reading Thomas Malthus's An Essay on the Principle of Population, what would in turn coin the term Malthusianism, or Malthusian, in referring to population control policies. This point of catastrophe seen on the graph is calculated as the point when the human population will exceed its carrying capacity, meaning the calculated number of organisms that an ecosystem can sustainably support. However, what determines the carrying capacity? Thomas Malthus, who created the Malthusian growth model, never actually specified an exact number for when the human population would hit its carrying capacity. This was because it was understood that the carrying capacity is not something fixed, but could be increased or decreased depending on human-made innovations such as agriculture. Thomas Malthus did, however, make the prophecy that we would hit our carrying capacity by 1890, about 100 years from the time he had made the prediction, which, needless to say, was very much off the mark. It should be noted that Malthus was fully convinced that his prophecy was accurate and that the only way to avoid such a catastrophe was to severely curb the growth of the human population immediately. This included the denial of medical care and food to the needy, since it was thought that the followers, uh, by the followers of Malthus that the postponement of their death would only use up further resources without any contribution to society. Sounds a little familiar, doesn't it? The reason why Malthus was so far off the mark was because such a point in the future concerning the human carrying capacity cannot be determined by a linear extrapolation, as Malthus attempts in this graph. This is because human innovations change our relationship to the resources we use in a qualitative manner and not just a quantitative manner. Qualitative change has always been the mathematician's nightmare in producing models that will supposedly predict trends in the future. How can a mathematical model predict all qualitative change that will happen in the future, which would mean a prediction of all future forms of innovation, invention, and discovery? Is it even possible? Thus far, the answer is no. As we will see, this will be a common theme when analyzing mathematical models that attempt to predict the distant future. In Thomas Malthus's essay on the principles of population, he wrote, we should facilitate, instead of foolishly and vainly endeavoring to impede the operations of nature in producing this mortality, and if we dredge the too frequent visitation of the horrid form of famine, we should sedulously encourage the other forms of destruction, which we compel nature to use. In our towns, we should make the streets narrower, crowd more people into the houses, and court the return of the plague. In 1838, upon reading Thomas Malthus's An Essay on the Principles of Population, Darwin formulated his theory of evolution based on the natural selection of the fittest. He coined the term as an analogy of what he termed artificial selection of selective breeding, with reference in particular to the practice of horse breeding. 
Darwin saw a similarity between farmers picking out the best stock in selective breeding and a Malthusian nature selecting from chance variants. That is, Darwin's idea of natural selection and survival of the fittest implied no directionality to evolution, but rather was based upon nature's selection of random variants. But how does one part of an organism evolve without affecting the other parts of that organism? Contrary to how we have been made to think of the, dis the, the discussion around evolution today, by the first part of the 1800s, the scientific community was primarily in agreement that living processes and their environments did indeed evolve. That is, Charles Darwin was one among many scientists at the time who were proponents of evolution. It was not a one-man show. The debate was thus not if evolution was indeed occurring, but rather how evolution was occurring. Again, contrary to how we are encouraged to think of this discussion today, there were many prominent and well-respected scientists in this field who did not think that the process of evolution contradicted the existence of a creator with an intelligent design. Georges Cuvier and Étienne Geoffroy Saint-Hilaire are two prominent examples of this. Their pioneering work in evolution is respected to this day, which opened up questions that have yet to be resolved. According to Étienne uh, Geoffroy Saint-Hilaire, there is an inherent potential in evolution. The potential for change is inherent within the organism, and the shaping of its many parts occurs in a harmonic, coherent way. That is, change moves in a purposeful manner, not a random manner. The evolution of wings for flight, the eyes for sight, the nervous system for thought, Geoffroy was stating that these were not the result of countless minute mutations occurring and being selected upon separate from the other, but that the transformations were occurring with the very intention to create forms of flight, sight, and thought. By Darwin rejecting this thesis, he created a paradox within his own theory. Either the potential for change is inherent in the organism in which many parts are able to change in a harmonic, coherent way, or it is not. However, if it is the latter, as Darwin claims it to be, random change of any part by itself, without acknowledgement of the whole, would more often than not lead to the death of the organism, as seen in the study of embryo formation, or would create a Dr. Morrow's Island of Freaks, which, by the by, is another novel by our anti-hero H.G. Wells. The elegant creations we actually do see arise through evolutionary processes would be an extreme rarity in such a world of randomness. With everything we know today of the incredibly intricate details of biochemistry, the coordination of metabolic processes which occur in their thousands of parts would all need to evolve as randomly separate processes and yet would also need to occur simultaneously and in conjunction with the other functioning parts. This would make Darwin's concept for the selection of random variants within a coordinated functioning whole fundamentally impossible. Not only is the evolution of the eye one of the miracles of evolution, it has countless variations upon itself, such that there is no one standard model for what is an eye. Are we thus to believe that this has randomly occurred not only once, but thousands of times in each species with its own distinct variation of what is an eye? At the time, there was a strong opposition to Darwin and Huxley within Europe and the United States. James Dwight Dana, a contemporary of T.H. Huxley, was among the American leadership that opposed this view and argued that evolution did progress with directionality, using examples such as the observation that biological organisms were proceeding towards greater cephalization. That is, that evolution was forming a general trend towards increasingly sophisticated nervous systems that could respond and interact with their environment. Thus, evolution was towards greater forms of complexity with more sophisticated forms of function. However, Thomas Huxley, Darwin's bulldog, was vehemently against this view of purposeful directionality in nature. It did not matter that Darwin's theory was just that, a theory, which still failed to explain much that was being observed in the evolutionary process, nor that T.H. Huxley would even admit that he did not ultimately believe in Darwin's theory. T.H. Huxley would be victorious in elevating Darwin's theory into accepted dogma and successfully circumventing the numerous holes in Darwin's theory in answering how life is formed and evolves. 
Despite these questions remaining unanswered to this day, Darwin's theory of evolution was celebrated as heralding a new age of science, a modern science. Out of this, two major changes occurred as a result. T.H. Huxley's avid promotion of Darwin's theory of evolution, uh, for one, uh, had nature, and thus one could say the universe, as governed not by purpose, but rather by randomness. And two, man was but a beast, no longer to be among the children of God, no longer regarded as partaking in anything that was divine or sacred. And if man is but a beast, what does he care for higher truths? What more does a beast need than the simple forms of comfort and happiness, the likes to which Mustafa Mond promoted in his Brave New World? I would like to quickly add that the worshipping of DNA is a continuation of a, a continuation and outcome of Darwin's theory of evolution, which is how we got to this whole transhumanist idea, and how we went from being compared to, to apes to now being compared to computers. Apparently, we are allowed to think of ourselves as anything but human, it would appear. The discovery of the molecular structure of DNA was hailed as a holy grail when it was first discovered in 1953 by Watson and Crick. Everything that we are was apparently already contained within the supposed molecular instructions we had within us that not only instructed how we were to be physically formed, but laid out the so-called blueprint for how our personalities, our temperaments, our desires, our, our addictions, our depravities were to be programmed within us. Thus, who, those who upheld this view to the extreme began denying that there was such a thing as free will and that we had all been programmed and thus predetermined in every action and outcome within our lives. As we see, Harari has continued this false belief in his thesis of humans being hackable algorithms, which I will discuss further shortly. The Human Genome Project was set out to map the entire human genome, thought it would be able to find the deterministic genes behind such unwanted traits as having a gambling addiction, alcoholism, homosexuality, homelessness, Applications towards sterilization and eugenics should not go unnoticed here under the guise of medicine. Suffice to say that to this day, there is no such proof that genes determine such things. The project had successfully collected a massive amount of data, but it is data largely without any meaning. They have relegated approximately 90% of our DNA as so-called junk DNA. The Human Genome Project failed in accomplishing its set-out goals, though it continues to be believed in academia that genes are what code all existence. Dawkins took it further and added the concept of a so-called selfish gene, that is, a gene which contains a program for specific outcomes, outcomes that we as individuals are unaware and unable to oppose. It was Watson and Crick who championed the idea that the DNA determines everything about the organism. They termed it the central dogma of biology. For the past 70 years, university textbooks and funding have unquestionably followed this dogma. Crick has stated that he, is, as a mere man, had eliminated the need for God or any other intelligence in the universe since everything about us flows from our DNA. He wrote in his Astonishing Hypothesis, 1994, you, your joys and your sorrows, your memories and your ambitions, your senses of personal identity and free will are in fact no more than the behavior of a vast assembly of nerve cells and their associated molecules. However, today, especially in the field of electromagneticism, this worshiping of DNA as the end-all, be-all blueprint for all life has come under serious scrutiny. In a 15-minute presentation available on YouTube titled Michael Clarge, Electrical Shaping of Biology, he goes over some of the key problems with upholding DNA as the blueprint for life. One case study he cites was from an experiment led by the Tufts University biologists. Flatworms have the ability to grow back their head or tail when it is cut off. In this experiment, however, the scientists cut off the head of a species of flatworm and subsequently changed the electromagnetic field around the decapitated area and were able to induce a new head to form that was from a different species of flatworm. The electromagnetic field needed to be specific in order to form one species of head versus another. The DNA did not change, only the electromagnetic field 
Thus, the ability to adopt the form of another species is clearly not limited to the so-called deterministic structure of DNA. Dr. Michael Clarge, lead scientist of the Sapphire Project, has said, why does any of this matter? It matters because the story of DNA that we grew up with and still teach to our children is not only wrong, it is actually harmful to our spirit because it gives us a false understanding of ourselves and of our relationship to the universe. We, need, we were told that a simple molecule with sequences of four molecular letters determines everything about us. We were assured that not only our shape, but our entire being is supposedly a simple unfolding of some molecular computer program into which we have no input. I find all aspects of this dogma incorrect and harmful. Maybe that was the intention all along. We have gone to comparing ourselves to apes to now comparing ourselves to computers. With, there is a clear avoidance in discussing what it is to be simply human. Alongside the biological studies in Darwinism of the 20th century were the mathematical studies, which would uphold the same core Darwinistic principles of human nature and the universe, and that change was random, not purposeful. At least, it was not a purpose we mere mortals could understand. At the very start of the 20th century, the influential International Congress of Mathematicians organized a conference in Paris, France in 1900. It was at this conference that David Hilbert, a leading mathematician at Göttingen University, was invited to speak on the future of mathematics, where he stressed the need for the field of mathematics to, quote, prove that all axioms of arithmetic are consistent and axiomatize those physical sciences in which mathematics plays an important role. What Hilbert was calling for in his challenge for the future of mathematics was that all scientific knowledge be reducible to the form of mathematical logic, that it be contained within a minimum of accepted truths and rules of derivation, which could be proven by consistent and complete formal mathematical proofs. Thus, all scientific knowledge would in the future be deduced from such mathematical models. There was nothing left to discover in the typical sense of what defined scientific investigation during the 19th century and earlier. Scientists only needed now to refer to the appropriate mathematical model. In 1900, Bertrand Russell and Alfred North Whitehead set out to meet Hilbert's challenge, which resulted in the Principia Mathematica, published 13 years later. Although Kurt Gödel would disprove the entire premise for the Principia Mathematica with his incompleteness theorems, the Principia Mathematica remained as one of the most influential works of the 20th century on not only shaping modern logic, but also formed the basis for the latter development of cybernetics and systems analysis by Russell's student Norbert Wiener during World War II, which was used as the operating system upon which transhumanism was based. In other words, Principia Mathematica put forward the argument that all knowledge is reducible to mathematical logic. This was disproven by Kurt Gödel, but is irregardless viewed as a mainstay in philosophy and mathematics to this day and is what has led to the development of cybernetics. Before you conclude that Russell himself didn't personally believe that irrationality was a fundamental force in the universe simply because he tried to formalize said universe, it is worth reading a section of his bitterly misanthropic view of humanity presented in his 1903 A Free Man's Worship. He writes, that man is the product of causes that had no provision of the end they were achieving, that his origin, his growth, his hopes and fears his loves and his beliefs, are but the outcome of accidental collocations of atoms. That no fire, no heroism, no intensity of thought and feeling can preserve individual life beyond the grave. That all the labors of the ages, all the devotion, all the inspiration, all the noonday brightness of human genius are destined to extinction in the vast death of the solar system and that the whole temple of man's achievement must inevitably be buried beneath the debris of a universe in ruins. All these things, if not quite beyond dispute, are yet so nearly certain that no philosophy which rejects them can hope to stand. Only within the scaffolding of these truths, only on the firm foundation of unyielding despair, can the soul's habitation henceforth be safely built. 
At least Russell does not deny the result of a so-called free man's worship, which is, according to Russell, the denial of the existence of a loving creator and thus the belief ultimately that man can, must, replace God. As we have re recently discovered, this idea of the vast death of the universe, something so nearly certain that no philosophy which rejects them can hope to stand, has also become an assumption that is now on very shaky ground. Russell was so certain that this Big Bang theory was yet another triumph over those arguing for a universe without direction and purpose, without a loving creator, that he actually was proud uh, of this and this apparent free man's worship that was built on this firm foundation of unyielding despair. However, it turns out that the Big Bang theory is also wrong, and now we can prove it. Thus, Russell looks rather ridiculous in his version of a free man's worship. It rather looks like Russell has been eating out of the trash bin this whole time when there was an abundant feast laid out beside him. The James Webb, Webb Telescope, which Matt went over briefly in his, uh, his first presentation at this conference, um, has come up with uh, some pictures that have defied all of the theories of the Big Bang Theory. We could say that we could try to fit this new data now into existing models that still want to try to convince us that the universe is dying, um, that it's uh, an entropic universe. But the point is, is that if the model were accurate, it would have been able to predict these things properly. We don't, uh, we don't have models, we don't collect data so that we can justify our models, right? If we're being honest scientists. Whether, uh, I don't know if I said that right, we don't fix the data to justify the models, is what I, w I meant to say. Whether deterministic or random in view, the goal was the same, to dishonestly promote a concept of the universe that had no governing purpose, no directionality, and no morality, that it was essentially a mechanism discoverable by a few simple mathematical laws. With such a view, our connection to the universe becomes inconsequential, with the universe seen as something cold, unknowable, and ultimately dead or dying. Such a concept only further enforces that there is no real meaning to anything. There is no purpose, at least it is not a purpose that we have any place in. However, as we have seen thus far, none of these dogmatic beliefs in the modern sciences, in other words, materialistic reductionist sciences, has been demonstrated through the rigors of actual scientific investigation, though it has been assumed that this is the case. In fact, these dogmas have been seen on rather shaky ground when put under an honest scientific scrutiny or have been outright disproven but continued anyway. Yet the belief continues under the guise of modern science. It turns out Harari is not the only one that relies more on prophecy than on scientific or philosophical rigor. Rather, after closer inspection, it would appear Harari is a descendant of a school of thought that is, seems to be made up of primarily false prophets and wannabe demigods rather than what would even remotely qualify as real scientists. Lastly, before discussing the algorithms of Harari, let us review a mathematical model that has come to govern all levels of how society functions. Game theory is considered by many to be an essential tool when modeling economic, political, sociological, and military behaviors and outcomes, and is taught in many prestigious universities as something pretty much set in stone. Game theory, the mathematical theory of games of strategy, was developed by John von Neumann in his book, Theory of Games and Economic Behavior, which he co-authored with Oscar Morgenstern. The crux of the theory is that an individual's behavior will always be motivated towards achieving an optimal outcome which is determined by selfish self-interests. It is acknowledged by John von Neumann in his own book that the entire functioning of their model relies upon the assumption that we are governed by rational, selfish behavior and that they feel confident about this assumption since reality has apparently confirmed this fact to them. The reason why mathematicians feel safe in making such assumptions like this, uh, like the assumptions Harari's algorithms are also laden with, is due to the continued dogmatic belief in Darwinism, and thus such an assumption that is put into an influential mathematical model no longer needs to be questioned. It is regarded as a fact in the world of mathematics. However, it is not a fact, 
and thus the entire model is rendered as a useless tool of prediction. It is, however, a very useful tool in conditioning, in programming the desired behavior, a controller like a brave new world Mustafa Moon would like to see in the people. In the case of game theory, they did not even attempt to prove that we were ultimately these predictable computer programs that will operate based on the most optimal outcome motivated by selfish self-interest. The entire hypothesis is based off of an assumption, and this is what we are calling modern science, which is apparently free from dogmatic belief systems. Such an oversimplification of human nature shows the audacity behind the assumptions that make up the formulations, uh, such mathematical formulations like game theory. You are nothing more than a virtual avatar in their synthetic world, with programmed limits to what you can and cannot do in the game they have created for you. Game theory does not represent the motivations behind human nature, but rather imposes such limitations, since, as they acknowledge themselves, it is easier to predict and control your chosen selfish behaviors, which are encouraged and rewarded with incentives within these games. It is a system of enslavement that encourages its slaves to fight each other for table scraps and never question the hand that withholds, the system that creates false scarcity and promotes antagonism over artificial stressors. We are taught never to question the rules given to us in these game theory scenarios, but to react accordingly to what has been defined to us as a limited set of options in an artificial scenario. The entertainment industry has pushed this idea that the best we can do as we are told we are headed towards an apocalyptic future is to merely adapt and survive, a survival at all costs. We have been conditioned to this idea of a survival at all costs, that is, a survival of the fittest within a post-apocalyptic world. We have learned to view this as our liberation, this false and delusional idea that as long as one can survive, such a life is worth living. We have been conditioned to not question our circumstances or how we got here. We have been conditioned to think that there is no solution and the only thing we can do is just accept the increasingly bleak future we are told is necessary and inevitable. Our life becomes similar to that of a lab rat who has no choice but to abide by the parameters of the game they were put in and figure out any means for survival. And in such a life, we have been conditioned to view that freedom and liberation can be attained if we earn the gold medal in such post-apocalyptic Olympic games. Freedom is no longer about questioning, resisting, and challenging the oppression and enslavement of a society, but rather it focuses on its best subjects, so to speak, its best survivors, who can best wield the sort of behavior its controllers want to see. It is Darwin's survival of the fittest in its final conclusion. Let us be honest with ourselves. Is there any dystopic vision we have for the future that is not imagery we have collected from some Hollywood sci-fi movie or novel? The very pictures in our head about major issues and subjects, including about the future, are increasingly being placed in our mind from the entertainment industry. Can you really say you are in charge of your thoughts if you allow yourself to be governed by such dystopic imagery? Thus, it should not be a surprise to us that Harari stated the best use for the so-called useless people is to put them on drugs and play video games. That is essentially what we are living, already living in if you are an adherent to game theory, cybernetics, and transhumanism. However, this is not a superior human or humanoid computer. That is a human bounding themselves to the rule of a game that has been artificially created to enslave them rather than to the laws of the universe. They have instead chosen to abide by artificial parameters created for them within such a game, believing this to be more real than reality itself. Let us look at some of the formulations Harari has made in order to promulgate his theory that humans are hackable. He has brought up these key concepts. The masters of society will be decided by who will own the data. Now data is replacing machinery as the most important asset, and if too much of the data becomes concentrated into few hands, humanity will be split, not into classes this time, but into species. Those who will form the superior species will be able to hack not only computers, but human beings and all other life forms. 
All you need to hack life is enough biometric data which will tell you, in the case of humans, what they are thinking, what they are motivated by, and what they desire. What is going on inside the brain? More points from Harari that he puts forward. Organisms are biochemical algorithms, and we are learning how to decipher these algorithms. When the infotech merges with the biotech revolution, what you get is the ability to hack human beings. One of the most important tools in collecting the necessary data to understand biological algorithms is the biometric sensor. If some, for those who don't know, biometric sensor is something that just simply measures your heart rate, your blood pressure, your eye movement, your breathing, these very simple measurements. If something is hackable, it means it will be able to also be engineered. Evolution by natural selection is now being replaced by evolution by intelligent design. Not by some guy above the clouds, but our intelligent design. And the intelligent design of our clouds, the IBM cloud, the Microsoft cloud, these are the new driving forces of evolution, says Harari. Harari tends to use sexual orientation and generalized political leaning as his example, examples of controllers knowing what we think. It is possible that Harari thinks humans are this simple, since he himself may be this simple. However, this is a lower order of existence. It is a beast-like existence, where Harari claims he, that Harari, where Harari claims it will know what excites you, causes you fear, makes you desirous, and so forth, based off of biometric data. But can it know your deeper, more profound thoughts, if you have any? Would such data tell you what a mind like Leibniz, Schiller, or Goethe is thinking? The answer is no. The concept of biological algorithms, like game theory, are meant as justifications for our self-imposed enslavement. It is to encourage ourselves to think of ourselves so simply. What a biological algorithm is essentially saying, which is the same thing that was being said with DNA and the selfish gene, is that you can't change your destiny. It is predetermined. You have no free will. This is why they want you to be as simple-minded as possible, and why they want you to believe that you are just a blob of flesh programmed to desire pleasure and avoid pain. If you agree to lower yourself to this simple existence, you will be the most easy to predict and control. Lie detectors use a great deal of the same measurements that biometric sensors measure, such as blood pressure, heart rate, breathing, rhythm, etc. However, polygraph test results are inadmissible in court, as they are not scientifically reliable enough for use when the stakes are so high, as in a court of law. This is because it is well documented that certain people can pass the test while lying, and others who are telling the truth can fail the test. Yet Harari is claiming that biometric sensors, which are pretty much just measuring the same things as a polygraph, except for also eye movement,、uh, are somehow going to tell us what is going on in our brain, which he equates to the mind. If a polygraph isn't even admissible in a court of law, why are we going to believe Harari's stark predictions for the future as something even possible? They want you to think that they have maximum control over you, so that you are defeated in your own imagined parameters that don't even exist in reality. In a mental prison, there is no need for four walls to actually confine you.、Um, here is an example of a mental prison that Jeremy Bentham. Bentham Uh, an English philosopher,、um, and also he invented what is called the the hedonist、uh, calculus.、Um, he invented the panopticon, which is this idea that there is a guard in the middle of a prison, but、uh, none of the cellmates know if the guard is watching them or not,、um, and so they all behave accordingly. But they behave because they are now self-regulating themselves. Um, if we believe in our mental prison, there is no need to have an actual prison. If we believe they are capable of all these incredible endeavors, we are accepting that we have essentially lost before we have even fought. So, to the end,、uh, to the question: Are humans hackable? Humans are not hackable, but they would like you to believe so. Based off of this doom and gloom prophecy of Harari, what does he finally offer up as a solution to the inevitability? Two years after his first presentation to the World Economic Forum, why world regulation, of course, 
And who are to be the world regulators of this technology, right? They make everybody really freaked out, and then they say the answer must be world regulation. Well, the World Economic Forum attempts to be coy in this, but obviously it is themselves who will be the world regulators. Singapore has unfortunately been the first country to sign on pairing with the World Economic Forum to implement uh, AI into their, uh, into their country. Apparently, our future is only doomed if we fail to elect the World Economic Forum as the overseers of the world. So, on back to this question of a modern science begets a modern religion begets a modern utopia. Harari has also said, we have no answer in the Bible of what to do when humans are no longer useful to the economy. You need completely new ideologies, completely new religions, and they are likely to emerge from Silicon Valley, not from the Middle East, and they are likely going to give people visions based on technology, everything that the old religions promised, happiness and justice and even eternal life, but here on Earth with the help of technology and not after death with the help of some supernatural being. It was H.G. Wells who was the, uh, among the first to discuss the need for a modern religion. Now that science had become modern, religion was considered still a useful tool, but now its focus would not be on a creator of the heavens, but rather on the worshipping of man as creator, who would take on the task of creating future man and all living life for all futurity. In H.G. Wells' The Open Conspiracy, Blueprints for a World Revolution, he makes no qualms in declaring his trilogy, The Outline of History, The Science of Life, and The Work, Wealth, and Happiness of Mankind, as the New Bible. It was T.H. Huxley who was H.G. Wells' mentor, and thus Wells was also heavily influenced by the work of Malthus and Darwin. Wells writes in his Open Conspiracy, to avoid the positive evils of war and to attain the new levels of prosperity and power that now come into view, an effective world control, not merely of armed force, but of the production and main movements of staple commodities and the drift and expansion of population is required. It is absurd to dream of peace and worldwide progress without that much control. The open conspiracy is not necessarily antagonistic to any existing government. The open conspiracy is a creative, organizing movement and not an anarchistic one. It does not want to destroy existing controls and forms of human association, but either to supersede or amalgamate them into a common world directorate. The League of Nations, the birth control movement and most radical and socialist societies are fields into which open conspiracy is a fuller and ampler movement into which these incomplete activities must necessarily merge as its idea takes possession of men's imagination. He goes on to write, the open conspiracy will build an encyclopedic conception of the modern economic complex, the world brain, as a labyrinthian pseudo-system progressively eliminating waste and working its way along multitudinous channels towards unity, towards clarity of a utilitarian purpose and method, towards abundant productivity and efficient social service. The character of the open conspiracy will now be plainly displayed. It will have become a great world movement as widespread and evident as socialism and communism. It will take the place of these movements very largely. It will be more than they were. It will be, frankly, a world religion. This large, loose, assimilatory mass of movements, groups, and societies will be definitely and obviously attempting to swallow up the entire population of the world and become the new human community. Just for clarification's sake here, the reference to communism and socialism by Wells is best understood through the work of Georges Sorel, who is investigating how socialism and communism could be warped in order to support a fascist outlook. The Italian fascists largely took up Georges Sorel's work and is why they called themselves national socialists before the world came to know them as Italian fascists. I go over this in my, my book. H.G. Wells was involved with the pro-fascist circles in Britain, and Oswald Mosley publicly supported Wells' vision for a scientific dictatorship. 
Wells writes, the establishment of the world community will surely exact a price, and who can tell what that price may be in toil, suffering, and blood? Wells wrote The First Men in the Moon, one of the many sci-fi novels he wrote, and the world brain is really uh, modeled off of what he considers the most ideal society, the most superior form of community, which is the ant colony. And uh, the first men in the moon go over this. Each subspecies um, for these uh, moon species would have the physical and mental attributes best suitable to their specialized narrow tasks in serving the ant community. H.G. Wells was also obsessed with equating head size with intelligence, and thus we see the most intelligent members of the ant colony with the biggest, bulbous heads. The smarter, the larger the head. This was Wells' dream for what could form a stable, peaceful, organizational system for humans. It was what inspired the work of Aldous Huxley in his Brave New World and his biological hierarchy created in a lab of epsilons, deltas, beta, betas, alphas, alpha pluses, and the about 13 or so world controllers likely imagined with bulbous heads. So let's get now to what truly defines humanity. And for this, I will be drawing from C.S. Lewis's The Abolition of Man. C.S. Lewis also wrote um, a sci-fi trilogy that many may not be aware of, um, and this was largely in response to what H.G. Wells was putting forward. Um, the Abolition of Man is also uh, an essay lecture that he, he delivered in response to this trend towards transhumanism that C.S. Lewis saw very insightfully already in uh, the 30s. Um, he saw where we were going. And uh, I recommend everyone read his sci-fi trilogy and The Abolition of Man. It's, it's quite insightful. So The Abolition of Man, he already starts with this assumption, let's say they have succeeded. Let's say they have managed to have full control over uh, creating man, becoming, you know, mortal gods, or actually, you know, they probably think they can live forever. So the new gods, they've replaced the old gods. C.S. Lewis writes, in what sense is man the possessor of increasing power over nature in this, this new world, right? Again, it's a, a, a thought experiment. He's not saying it will happen. The final stage is come when man, by eugenics, by prenatal conditioning, and by an education and propaganda based on a perfect applied psychology, has obtained full control over himself. Human nature will be the last part of nature to surrender to man. The battle will then be won. The battle will indeed be won. But who, precisely, will have won it? They, these conditioners, are rather not men in the old sense at all. They are, if you like, men who have sacrificed their own share in traditional humanity in order to, to devote themselves to the task of deciding what humanity shall henceforth mean. Good and bad are words without content, for it is from them that the content of these words is henceforth to be derived. However far they go back or down, they can find no ground to stand on outside of the Tao, the way, which we'll discuss further afterwards. Every motive they try to act on becomes at once petitio, in Latin meaning begging the question, an informal fallacy. It is not that they are bad men. They are not men at all. Stepping outside the Tao, they have stepped into the void. Nor are they subjects necessar uh, necessarily unhappy men. They are not men at all. They are artifacts. Man's final conquest has proved to be the abolition of man. He goes on to say, when all that says it is good has been debunked, what says I want remains. The conditioners, therefore, must come to be motivated simply by their own pleasure. Those who stand outside all judgments of value cannot have any ground for preferring one of their own impulses to another except the emotional strength of that impulse. By the logic of their position, they must just take their impulses as they come, from chance, and chance here means nature. Their extreme rationalism, by seeing through all rational motives, leaves them creatures of wholly irrational behavior. If you will not obey the Tao or else commit suicide, obedience to impulse 
and therefore in the long run to mere nature, is the only course left open. At the moment, then, of man's victory over nature, we find the whole human race subjected to some individual men, and those individuals subjected to that in themselves which is purely natural, to their irrational impulses. Nature, untrammeled by values, rules the conditioners, and through them, all humanity. Man's conquest of nature turns out, in the moment of its consummation, to be nature's conquest of man. Every victory we seem to win has led us step by step to this conclusion. All nature's apparent reverses have been tactical withdrawals. We thought we were beating her back when she was luring us on. What looked to us like hands held up in surrender was really the opening of arms to enfold us forever. If the fully, if the fully planned and conditioned world with its Tao a mere product of the planning, comes into existence, nature will be troubled no more by the rest of species that rose in revolt against her so million years ago. It will be vexed no longer by its chatter of truth and mercy and beauty and happiness. And if the eugenics are efficient enough, there will be no second revolt, but all snug beneath the conditioners and the conditioners beneath her, that is nature, till the moon falls or the sun grows cold. Man's conquest of nature turns out to be, in the moment of its consummation, to be nature's conquest of man, the abolition of man. Stepping outside the Tao, they have stepped into the void. All of these lofty ambitions they hold as the self-professed new gods of the world will fall very short from their mark, since they are striving to achieve the impossible. You cannot create the laws of the universe anew, Thus far from achieving the status of a god like Icarus and his wax wings, they have only caused their own self-destruction. C.S. Lewis also writes, this is a preceding section to the abolition of man, but I thought it was more suitable to end on this because this is really the mainstay, this is the truth, whereas the abolition of man is a hyp hypothetical thought experiment to see where we lead ourselves with such grand illusions. C.S. Lewis writes in the Tao, it looks, in fact, as if an ethics based on instinct will give the innovator all he wants and nothing that he does not want in this new world, right? In reality, we have not advanced one step, for I think it is here being used in a fairly definite sense to mean an unreflective or spontaneous impulse wildly felt by the members of a given species. In what way does instinct thus conceived help us to find real value? Telling us to obey instinct is like telling us to obey people. People say different things. So do instincts. Our instincts are at war. Each instinct, if you listen to it, will claim to be gratified at the expense of all the rest. And the idea that without appealing to any court higher than the instincts themselves, we can yet find grounds for preferring one instinct above its fellows, dies very hard. The truth finally becomes apparent that neither in any operation with factual propositions nor in any appeal to instinct can the innovator find the basis for a new system of values. None of the principles he requires are to be found there, but they are all to be found somewhere else. All within the four seas are his brothers, says Confucius. Do as you would be done by, says Jesus. All the practical principles behind the innovator's case for posterity or society or the species are there from time immemorial in the Tao, but they are nowhere else. The innovator attacks traditional values, the Tao, in defense of what he at first supposes to be, in some special sense, rational or biological values. But as we have seen, all the values which he uses in attacking the Tao and even claims to be substituting for it are themselves derived from the Tao. If the Tao falls, all his own conceptions of value fall with it. Not one of them can claim any authority other than that of the Tao. Only by such shreds of the Tao as he has inherited is he enabled even to attack it. This is the last big slide. <laughs> Since I can see no answer to these questions, I draw the following conclusion. This thing which I have called for convenience the Tao, and which others may call natural law 
or traditional morality, or the first principle of practical reason, or the first platitudes, is not one among a series of possible systems of value. It is the sole source of all value judgments. If it is rejected, all value is rejected. If any value is retained, it is retained. The effort to refute it and raise a new system of value in its place is self-contradictory. There has never been and never will be a radically new judgment of value in the history of the world. The rebellion of new ideologies against the Tao is a rebellion of the branches against the tree. If the rebels could succeed, they would find that they have destroyed themselves. The human mind has no more power of inventing a new value than of imagining a new primary color, or indeed of creating a new sun and a new sky for it to move in. There is a difference between a real moral advance and a mere innovation. From the Confucian, do not do, not do to others what you would not like them to do to you, to the Christian, do as you would be done by, is a real advance. The morality of Nietzsche is a mere innovation. The first is an advance because no one who did not admit the validity of the old maxim could see reason for accepting the new one. And anyone who accepted the old would at once recognize the new as an extension of the same principle. If he rejected it, he would have to reject it as a superfluity, something that went too far, not as something simply heterogeneous from his own ideas of value. But the Nietzschean ethic can be accepted only if we are ready to scrap traditional morals as mere error and then to put ourselves in a position where we can find no ground for any value judgment at all. It is the difference between a man who says to us, you like your, ve your vegetables moderately fresh, why not grow your own and have them perfectly fresh? And a man who says, throw away that loaf and try eating bricks and centipedes instead. Those who understand the spirit of the Tao and who have been led by that spirit can modify it in directions which that spirit itself demands. Only then can they know, only they can know what those directions are. So I will end by saying a few words, but don't be fooled by today's self-professed magicians, the wizards of Oz who claim such lofty powers. It is all sitting on a hill of sand and is a mere illusion of what it is to be all-powerful. To deny that anything noble came out of civilization such that the wonderful discoveries that have been made in various fields, which have not only uplifted our life, but offered us such wonders as being able to ascertain a beauty that can only come through higher learning. If we deny this, we are denying that civilized part within ourselves. We are cutting out our better nature. Schiller talked about the savage and the barbarian in his aesthetical letters. He wrote, man can be self-opposed in a twofold manner, either as savage, if his feelings rule his principles, or as barbarian, if his principles destroy his feelings. If we convince ourselves that we are most noble as a savage or barbarian, then we will be most easily controlled through our base desires and enslaved. The more noble our nature, the more free we are. Thus, it is no coincidence that a system of empire would not want us to have an identity of a just and beautiful concept of our civilization. It is the most prevalent and effective censorship one could have. There is no need to censure, censure books and speech when people have no desire to read or speak them in the first place. The problem with the misuse of technology is thus what is the governing structure's intention for such a society. Today, our world primarily lives to benefit tyranny. Our financial system, our education system, our transforming culture, our rewriting of history, our outright censorship of history, our sciences have all been taken over. Thus, it is not just a technological crisis we are living in, it is an existential crisis. We will not solve an existential crisis by simply taking certain materials out of our lives. We have to become reconnected to our better selves and no longer abide to serve a system that upholds tyranny. Tyranny does not require advanced technology to exist. 
Tyranny reigns supreme wherever we find a people who do not view themselves as free, strong, and dignified. That is our crisis today. It is the wannabe controller's best interest that we view the situation as hopeless, that we view it as inevitable, since we will not oppose such a future if we are already mentally defeated. We will not risk anything to fight for a better future if we think a better future is not possible. We will simply be content to live moment to moment, hoping we can delay as much as possible the dark clouds looming ahead. Our nature is not what we have been told by the likes who have promoted the doctrine of modern science and modern religion. We are, in fact, beings that are sacred and partake in the good, the true, and the beautiful. We have been lied to and debased in order that we be more easily controlled. It is up to every individual whether they choose to exit this artificial reality that has been created to enslave their mind within a mental construct and participate instead in what is to be truly human. Our freedom, our salvation from the spiritual torment of our existential crisis can rather be simply accessed if we recognize our true nature, not a savage or barbarian, but our best nature, our most noble nature. As Schiller wrote it in his aesthetical letters, it is through beauty that is a noble soul that we arrive at freedom. Thank you.